This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from San Francisco from the Global Climate Action Summit, but we're continuing to talk about what's happening in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia and Georgia. Millions of residents bracing for the arrival of Hurricane Florence, which meteorologists are warning could unleash life-threatening storm surges and historic flooding across a wide swath of East Coast, even if the storm weakens. Experts warn Hurricane Florence could kill thousands of farm animals, trigger catastrophic waste spills from sewage treatment plants, hog waste, lagoons and chicken farms. Meanwhile, Inside Climate News has published a map showing 24 toxic coal ash containment ponds in the path of Hurricane Florence that may flood in the extreme rainfall. Uh, we're continuing our discussion in North Carolina, where we're joined in Charlotte by Frank Holloman, who is a senior attorney at the Southern Environmental Law Center, where he works on protecting river streams, groundwater and drinking water sources from coal ash, including after a North Carolina facility owned by Duke Energy spilled 39,000 tons of coal ash into the Dan River in 2014. And still with us, Will Hendrick, staff attorney with the Waterkeeper Alliance, um, or manager of the organization's North Carolina Pure Farms, Pure Waters campaign. Frank, talk about the coal ash ponds and what you're most concerned about right now. And thanks, as people are preparing in North Carolina, dealing, evacuating, for being in a studio, Frank. Yes. Well, thank you for having me. And we're hoping and praying we don't have a coal ash catastrophe in North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia in the next few days. But here's what we face. Uh, the coal ash utilities in the southeast, and in this instance, principally Duke Energy and also uh, Dominion in Virginia, have stored millions of tons of coal ash in unlined pits sitting directly adjacent to our rivers, lakes, and drinking water reservoirs, and they're held back only by dikes made of earth that leak. Now, in the past 10 years, we've had two major coal ash disasters. One at TVA and its Kingston facility in Tennessee, and one by Duke Energy itself on the Dan River in North Carolina near the Virginia line. But those catastrophes happened on a good day when the sun was shining. Each of these sites, we've been warning and is obvious, is a tremendous risk to our communities, particularly when we have a major hurricane a flood or a storm. So we're sitting here with more than 20 disasters waiting to happen. We hope none of them do happen, but this is a risk we don't have to tolerate. This ash can be moved to safe dry line storage away from the rivers. And there is one somewhat good news story about this storm, and that is the coastal utilities in South Carolina instead of lobbying and litigating, have actually been removing ash the last several years so that the risk on the South Carolina coast is much reduced from coal ash. Mm. But in North Carolina and Virginia, uh, our coastal residents have to fear the consequences of decades of bad practices and recent years of recalcitrance um, by Duke Energy and Dominion. Can you explain where the coal ash comes from, Frank? Oh, sure. In other words, uh, historically, a lot of the electricity in the Carolinas and Virginia and Georgia has been generated by burning coal. And you need two things to generate electricity from coal. You need coal to burn, and you need water to generate steam. So they've located uh, these coal-fired plants near water bodies, that is, rivers and lakes and drinking water reservoirs. And when they burn the coal, they're left with ash. Now, the, the ash isn't wet, and it doesn't have to go in a pit. It could simply have been moved uphill and stored dry in a line landfill, or even recycled into concrete. But instead, to save some money and for their convenience, the utilities dug big pits between their plants and the river simply because water runs downhill. So they'd suck water out of the river, mix it, and create a polluted mess with this ash, they call that slurry, and then just flush it downhill into these unlined pits. It's 
obviously a foolish way to store this stuff. It's obviously risky and dangerous, and it obviously pollutes on a good day. But on a bad day, when we have a serious hurricane, this unnecessary choice puts communities and waterways and clean drinking water at risk. Frank, can you talk about the law that North Carolina passed six years ago prohibiting state and local agencies from making planning decisions based on the latest climate science about sea level rise? Well, it's just another chapter in the sad story we've seen in America, and that is uh, sometimes People with money at stake uh, seek to deny the truth and prevent our agencies and communities from using good science because of those people's financial self-interest. Uh, uh, the science has shown us that sea level rise is accelerating. Uh, and uh, there was a proposal to prevent state agencies from considering that evidence at all when they make decisions about what can happen at the coast in light of ongoing sea level rise. Well, that caused a furor, and uh, the legislat legislator involved became the subject of ridicule by Colbert and other uh, comedians across the country. So they backed off, but they still said, for the, you, in making projections out to 30 years, you can't use that information. More than anything, though, it illustrates how politicians who are responding to special interests can restrict and even intimidate state agencies and policymakers from using the best science to make the best decisions for the most people. Frank, I wanted to bring Bill McKibben into this conversation. As I said, we're here in San Francisco broadcasting through the week for all the events around the Global Climate Action Summit. Bill McKibben is one of those who was in the streets on Saturday. Tens of thousands of people marched in San Francisco and, of course, people marched in hundreds of cities all over the world. Um, but this issue of this law in North Carolina, um, Bill, if you could talk more about it. So uh, the first thing to be said is everything's connected. How many stories have you done about gerrymandering and voting suppression and things in North Carolina? Uh, North Carolina has endured what amounts to a kind of corporate takeover of its politics in recent years, though people are fighting back hard. And one of the manifestations was uh, an almost literally insane law, the kind of King Canute hold back the rising seas law that we weren't going to pay attention to the latest climate science. Just uh, uh, imagine passing a law saying, in essence, we, we cover our eyes and cover our ears. And so they can't deal with climate science when it comes to sea level rise, and that's precisely well, with um, Hurricane Florence what they are terrified of at this moment. That's right. Um, they can't it, it stopped people from, among other things, really thinking as hard as they should be about coastal development. Uh, there's been a increase of several orders of magnitude in the number of structures along the North Carolina coast in the last few decades. And I, I'm afraid we may find out just how flimsy a lot of that is in the next 48 hours. As you know, the, the category strength of Florence has dropped, but it's an enormous storm now, and it's bringing not only storm surge, probably on a record level, but once that water reaches inland and falls in the mountains, it's going to be coming back down those rivers and streams, which are plugged by the uh, higher sea level. <coughs> the potential for a flooding catastrophe is like nothing we've almost ever seen. And I wanted to uh, go back right now to Will Hendrick and ask you about um, the effects of what we're talking about right now, particularly on communities of color. Uh, and the most vulnerable populations. I mean, everyone is going to be affected. But talk about why this is a particular concern right now. Certainly. And uh, sadly, while our leaders have their heads in the sand, many North Carolinians are, are filling sandbags and preparing for the impact of, of this storm. And it's one more thing that some among us have to worry about. Every North Carolinian in the coastal plain is making preparations to ensure their family and their property are safe. 
But unfortunately, some North Carolinians have industrial operations situated right next to them. And that means that while they're worrying about the storm, they're also worrying about the flooding, the runoff, the potential structural failure of the impoundment storing tremendous volumes of animal waste next door to their homes, next door to their property, next door to the castle to which they're retreating in this time of need. And that sadly is, is a plight that is uh, disproportionately uh, felt and experienced by communities of color. Um, they are more likely uh, to live next to one of these industrial hog operations. Um, and that's a point that we have made to our leaders in our environmental division uh, of water resources. Uh, and that's the division that permits the continued operation of this outdated lagoon and spray field system. Um, and so along with Naima Muhammad and her group at North Carolina Environmental Justice Network and some of the local uh, environmental justice organizations like the Rural Empowerment Association for Community Health, we pointed out the, the, the fundamental problems with discriminating in that fashion and making some among us more uh, required to and more vulnerable to uh, uh, living near these inherently threatening uh, industrial waste sources. Um, many of them are concerned about what they've seen in the past and what they expect to, to repeat. Um, those lagoons overflowing, uh, the dikes that keep the waste uh, collected failing and spewing uh, millions of gallons uh, into their drinking water sources, into their recreational waters. Um, and you know, the, the impacts have been seen and experienced countless times now in North Carolina. And as a result of climate change, these storms are growing increasingly frequent and severe. Uh, and it's past time for our leaders to demand better waste management. Uh, and if, as projected, this storm causes the damage that it might, I hope that our leaders, when asked to rebuild this industry, will rebuild it with better technology so that it stands on better footing and North Carolinians uh, can better live their lives uh, without fear of interference by industrial operations next door. Will Hendrick, I want to thank you for being with us of the Waterkeeper Alliance, speaking to us from Raleigh, North Carolina. I also want to thank Frank Holloman uh, with Southern Environmental Law Center, uh, speaking to us from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I hope you are all safe. Of course, we'll continue to follow this uh, storm that people are talking about um, as one of the worst, possibly, that the East Coast has faced in a very long time. I also want to thank Bill McKibben, but he's staying with us, co-founder of 350.org. Stay with us.